we begin lectures for MA students in text linguistics. The aim of our course is to familiarize students with major series of text. We are going to give a brief review of the evolution of text linguistics from early rhetoric till present and discuss the problem of text definition from different methodological viewpoints. We would also introduce and analyze basic notions of text comprising both text-centered and pragmatic standards of textuality. Our lectures are mainly based on the books by which text linguistics is taught in American and European universities. The list of references comprises such books as Introduction to Text Linguistics by Bogrand and Dressler, Functional Sentence Perspective and the Organization of the Text by Danish, Cohesion in English by Halliday and Hassan, Discourse Analysis by Harris, Pragmatics by Levinson, Discourse Analysis for Language Teachers by McCarthy, Tense Variation in Narrative by Schifrin, Some Problems of Communicative Text Series by Schmidt, Speech Acts by Johnson, and Grammatical Categories and Their Text Functions by Zydetis. We provide each lecture with a list of references that will help you expand your knowledge on the given topic. The topic of lecture one is the subject and evolution of text linguistics. Text linguistics studies the text as a communicative lingual sign of the high strength. It describes and explains both the shared and the distinctive features of different types of texts. It aims to find out what standards text must fulfill, how they might be produced or received, or what people are using them for in a given setting of occurrence, and so forth. As Bogrand and Dressler indicate, the words and sentences on the sentence on the pages are reliable clues, but they cannot be the total picture. The more pressing question is how texts function in human interaction. In English and American linguistic literature, instead of text linguistics, preference is given to the use of the term discourse analysis. As a rule, the term discourse is understood in its broad sense, its conceptual meaning being represented by an oppositional binary paradigm, that of the conversation analysis and the analysis of the written discourse, that's written text. Still, some linguists, as Bogrand in the USA, Halliday in the UK and others, employ the term text in their writings. In the 60s of the previous century, the notion of text linguistics was familiar to only a few researchers. But we can now look back on a substantial expanse of work. However, the picture that emerges is diffuse and diversified because there is no established methodology that would apply to text in any way comparable to the unified approaches for conventional linguistic objects like the sentence. The oldest form of preoccupation with the text can be found in rhetoric dating from ancient Greece and Rome through the Middle Ages right up to the present. The major task of rhetoricians was to train public orators. The main areas they focused on were usually the following. Invention, that implied the discovery of ideas. Disposition, that implied the arrangement of ideas. Elocution, the discovery of appropriate expressions for the ideas. And memorization, prior to delivery on the actual occasion of speaking. In the Middle Ages, Rhetoric belonged to the trivium, three studies, together with grammar, that 
implied formal language patterns usually of Latin and Greek, and logic which implied construction of arguments and proofs. It is plain that, despite its different terms and methods, classical rhetoric was vitally involved in seeking the ways how texts were produced, presented, and received. Another source of text linguistics is stylistics. Quintilian, an early rhetorician named for qualities of style, correctness, clarity, elegance, and appropriateness. While correctness depends on conformity with prestigious usage, and appropriateness is similar to modern understanding of this notion, the notions of clarity and elegance seem at first too vague and subjective to be reliably defined and qualified. Yet, Quintilian's categories reflect the assumption that texts differ in quality because of the extent of processing resources expended on their production. When modern linguistics began to emerge, it was customary to limit investigation within the framework of the sentence as the largest unit with an inherent structure. Whatever structures might obtain beyond the sentence were assigned to the domain of stylistics. It is much more straightforward to decide what constitutes a grammatical and accessible sentence than what constitutes a grammatical or accessible sentence sequence, paragraph, text, or discourse. For when we move beyond the sentence boundary, we enter a domain characterized by greater freedom of selection or variation and lesser conformity with established rules. Texts have been a long-standing object of literary studies, though emphasis was limited to certain text types. Scholars mostly concentrated on tasks such as describing the text production processes and the ways of realization of an author's ideas and intentions as well as assigning values to texts. The attempt to make these tasks more systematic and objective has stimulated an application of linguistic methods to literary studies. Quite possibly, the expanded scope of text linguistics renders it still more useful in this kind of application than the conventional methodology of describing structures as such. Bogrand and Dressler stress that linguists try to go beyond these structures and ask how and why texts are built and utilized. Another discipline that influenced the development of text linguistics was sociology. It has developed an interest in the analysis of conversation as a mode of social organization and interaction. The study of conversation, sometimes also called discourse analysis, is of vital importance to a science of text. The mechanisms which combine texts as a single contributions into discourses as sets of mutually relevant texts directed to each other reveal major factors about the standards of textuality. The integration of sociology and linguistics has provided invaluable data on language in use. The major contribution lies in the systematic recognition of relationship between language, its users, and the settings of communication. The further development of text linguistics was connected with methods termed descriptive or structuralist. 
Scholars started to analyze language as a system of signs according to its constituent minimal units that were organized by the principle of hierarchy of levels. The specific essence of this hierarchy lay in the fact that units of any higher level were formed of units of the immediately lower one. Minimal units of sound were called phonemes. Those of elementary meaningful form were formed called morphemes. Those of word order syntagmems. Those of meaning seems or simemes, and so forth. But this hierarchical relation does not imply that it might be reduced to the mechanical composition of larger units from the smaller ones. Units of each level are characterized by their own specific functional features, so that units of each level are in some way distinct from all others. Such an approach to the analysis of lingual signs implied that each system of minimal units constituted a level organized by the opposition of units and their distinctive features, so that each unit was in some way distinct from all others. Early structuralists believed that when all the systems of a language had been identified and their systems and units classified, the language could have been completely described. We will devote a special lecture to the structural methodology of analysis of lingual units, pointing out how its evolution affected the development of text linguistics as one of the independent branches of linguistics. A very important role in the development of text linguistics was played by Zelik Harris, the first structuralist in the USA who concentrated on the problem of text generation in his well-known work, Discourse Analysis. Harris proposed to analyze the distribution of kernel sentences in text according to equivalences. That's relationship in which elements were the same or had the same environments. To increase the number of equivalences and thus to make this course analysis more exhaustive, Harris applied the notion of transformation that was later adopted and modified by his pupil Noam Chomsky. Chomsky laid a conceptual foundation for a new cognitive approach to linguistic studies and created transformational generative method of analysis that formed the basis for universal grammar. The main idea of Chomsky's universal grammar was that with a limited number of models of kernel sentences and the transformational rules, one could generate and create an infinite number of texts. The essence of these transformations lay in the universal nature of the human brain that cognitive processes find their realization and the structuring of sentences. Chomsky differentiated between surface and deep structures of a sentence. The underlying semantic structures of kernel sentences are universal for all the languages reflecting the world of objective reality, while their explication and the surface structures vary from language to language due to the morphological peculiarities of the given language. Chomsky and other linguists who built on his work formulated transformational rules with the help of which a sentence with a given grammatical structure, that's for instance John Sell Mary, could be transformed into a sentence with a different grammatical or surface structure but the same essential meaning. Mary was seen by John. But in his theory, 
Chomsky ignored the pragmatic aspect of linguistic analysis. Even at present, he continues to reject semantic theories that are based on truth and reference and consequently require the study of language world relations in the social cultural context of communication. Yet, Transformational linguistics has influenced the evolution of text linguistics in a peculiar way, as it offered a means of handling complexity and open systems according to which the infinite set of possible data in standard model is seen as derivable, derivable from a small set of basic patterns of kernel sentences plus a set of rules for manipulating and creating more elaborate patterns. Besides this, Harris's discourse analysis and Chomsky's early works on syntax have proved that cohesion of text entails a certain degree of recurrence and parallelism of syntactic patterns from sentence to sentence. One of the fundamental works that had a great impact on the development of text linguistics was Roland Harweg's research pronominant text constitution. Harweg postulated that texts are held together by the mechanism of substitution, that is, one expression following up another one of the same sense or reference, thus forming a cohesive or coherent relationship. Harvick's notion of substitution is extraordinarily broad and complex, subsuming relationships such as recurrence, synonymy, class, instance, subclass, superclass, cause, effect, part, whole, and others under this category. He focuses on the directionality of the substitution, that is, the order in which something follows up whatever it's being substituted for. There were a number of other text studies based more or less on the descriptive structural approach. The text was defined as a unit larger than the sentence. Research proceeded by discovering types of text structures and classifying them in some sort of scheme. A considerable contribution to the development of text linguistics was made by Czech linguists who belonged to the Prague linguistic circle. They focused on the functional, that's communicative aspect of the language. Czech linguists, Danish Virbas and others worked out a theory known as functional sentence perspective that formed cognitive basis for the communicative development of the text. They detected that the relations of thoughts to each other and the mental processes underlie the informational development of the text and affect the arrangement of words in sentences. According to this theory, each sentence functionally proceeds from the previous one, pushing the information from the given or known piece of information called the theme to a new actual information called the ring. In other words, Sentence elements can function by setting the knowledge they activate into a perspective of importance or newness of information. In English, as well as in many other languages, elements conveying important new or unexpected information are reserved for the later part of the sentence. Stem rim distribution of information showed clearly that it was impossible to limit linguistic analysis within the sentence structure, that functional analysis of lingual units required a textual level. Later, Danish worked out some models of communicative informational development of microtexts. 
been based on the cognitive mental processes of human brain, they were acknowledged as universals for many languages. And finally, the evolution of text linguistics has been inseparable from the promotion of pragmatics as a constituent part of communicative linguistics. British scholar Michael Halliday writes that text is language in use. It implies that text is a speech product, whereas language exists as a system of virtual signs that represent building material for the text. In other words, language system provides the speaker or the writer with abstract models by which they convert their own ideas into a text. Text, as a communicative verbal unit, has its peculiar characteristics. Textual characteristics are first of all predetermined by a whole set of such factors as the communicants comprising both the addresser and the addressee, the text with the help, the interact, the place and the time of the communication, the correspondence between the textual world and the object world of reality, and so on. This means that while analyzing a text, we should focus on the features that completely differ from lingual units proper. The set of all these and other similar characteristics has led to the development of pragmatics as an inseparable branch of communicative linguistics. At present, text linguistics and pragmatics represent two interdependent aspects of discourse analysis, be it conversations or written tests, texts. Accordingly, Scholars focus on such pragmatic aspects of textuality as the speaker's or the writer's communicative intention and its realization in the text, the text's acceptability, its social-cultural context, and so forth. Thus, we have outlined the subject area of text linguistics and provided a brief survey of its historical background focusing on the disciplines and theories as well as on the researches by prominent scholars that had a considerable impact on the development of text linguistics as an independent branch of linguistics. That's all for this lecture. Thank you for attention.